Looking at statistics, it seems we have some female viewers. No product can survive without targeting outside their demographic. But what do women want? But I feel like everyone is going to wish they knew who was really last on the list. I'll try and keep this less clickbaity. That means when you click on the link or the thumbnail, you get what's advertised. This also means banning the use of words such as beautiful, sexiest, dangerous, annoying, hated, outrageous, or see this. I also want it to be based on facts and information rather than just an opinion. Wow, that's one really outrageous dress. I mean, seriously, it's like a cupcake. Man, if this is only like number 11 on the list, number 10 on the list has to be even more outrageous. Oh, okay, that's slightly less outrageous. Um, yeah, once again, still outrageous, but not quite as outrageous as a cupcake. Yeah, that's just, that's just boobies. That's not actually that outrageous. Uh, um, maybe I'll write them a letter. Dear mom.me Your list on outrageous dresses was factually incorrect. Dress number 11 was far more outrageous than dress number 10, dress number 9, and the one where her boobies are hanging out. I think you need to update this list in order to clarify the accuracy. Is this just 15 outrageous dresses, or is this the most outrageous dresses in history? If so, I believe dress number 11 deserves to be dress number 9. Signed, Canadian Histoire. So, without further ado, my first list. There are some premieres you wish would just go. GET OUT! This list tracks the premieres who rode a wave of popular support and who resigned or died before losing power. These are Canada's longest serving premieres. Number 10. Sir Rodmond Roblin. A direct descendant of American loyalists, Roblin was on the higher end of Manitoban society. His first attempt at election failed, but would move to another riding and win in a by-election. Roblin was elected as a liberal, but left his party for the opposition conservatives after the failure of the liberals to deliver a railroad. The opposition leader died, and Roblin stepped up to become the leader. Roblin challenged Premier Greenway on a discriminatory school policy, which became known as the Manitoba Schools Crisis. Roblin was unsuccessful in beating Greenway, so he stepped down, and someone else did. Then that guy stepped down, and Roblin became Premier. Roblin made himself Minister of Two Departments as well as Premier, and centralized all power around himself. Roblin was successful in staying in power for 14 years through single-issue populism and resigned after a scandal broke out. His grandson also became premier. Roblin was successful in affecting federal politics and helped install Robert Borden as prime minister. As a gift, Robert Borden expanded the borders of Manitoba to what they are today. Number 9. Louis Alexander Taschetero Elected during the time of the Great Depression, Tash Chero became a national voice in opposing any sort of American New Deal type proposals. Instead, he championed investment and industrialization. Before Tash Chero, Quebec was largely an agrarian society, but after Tash Chero, it became an industrial and technological staple of Canadian society. Tash Chero was battling against ultranationalists and attempted to pass pro Jewish laws. Tash Tashiro gave the province a monopoly on Quebec education and a monopoly on alcohol distribution. While standing against the forces of ultranationalism and the Americans, he maintained 16 years in power. Number 8. Richard Hatfield Named after Conservative Prime Minister R.B. Bennett, Richard Hatfield was born into a family of vast wealth. Hatfield became Premier in 1970. 
During constitutional talks, Hatfield became a close ally of Trudeau, convincing other provinces to agree to patriation of the Constitution. Hatfield had two goals in his time in office, protect French-speaking rights in New Brunswick and attract future industries to his province. On French Acadian rights, he was successful, and to this day, New Brunswick maintains as the only true bilingual province in Canada. On attracting industry, he had failed. He was successful in attracting an auto plant to build New Brunswick, but when costs exceeded profits, the plant shut down and left the province forever. Some consider Hatfield to be Canada's first gay premier. However, this information stayed in the closet right up until his death. Being a free spirit, he was caught with a small amount of marijuana on his person, and in the upcoming election, rumors spread like wildfire about his promiscuous lifestyle. He was defeated and lost his own seat. Number 7. Tommy Douglas In 1930, Tommy Douglas completed his doctoral thesis in sociology. The topic? Testing people before marriage to prevent the births of low-intellect individuals. His doctorate was completed in Chicago, where he hung out with Marxists and Leninists, who he claimed sat around all day and did nothing but quote Marx. Douglas returned to Canada and joined the Federal Socialist Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. As being someone who visited Germany, he rose to national attention after calling upon the country to rise up and declare war on Nazi Germany immediately. At the time, Mackenzie King was in good relations with Hitler and was following the European standard of letting him do what he wants. Douglas's words would resound ten years later in 1942 when Canada was in a long-standing war with Germany and the party asked him to lead their Saskatchewan branch. In 1944, Douglas had swept the province and became North America's first socialist democracy. Over five terms in office, Douglas moved Saskatchewan further and further to the left with the successful creation of many crown corporations. Douglas created a provincially run auto insurance scheme that still exists today. Douglas also created public health care, publicly owned utilities, a Saskatchewan Bill of Rights, and also allowed public service employees to unionize. Many of Douglas's reforms would be copied across the country. Douglas would be on the forming board for a party that would originally be called the New Party, but eventually would become the New Democratic Party. Number six, Maurice Duplessis. Duplessis' Union de Nationale was successful in ending four decades of liberal rule in Quebec. Shortly after Duplessis misjudged Quebec's support for World War II and called a snap election in hopes of having a longer mandate through it, it failed. He would return as premier in 1944 and remained unopposed for 15 more years. Duplessis was conservative through and through. He wanted to keep Quebec as an agrarian society. He opposed conscription, he supported the Roman Catholic Church, and he sought to persecute the Jehovah's Witnesses. Duplessis won his final election and then shortly died. Number 5. W.A.C. Bennett William Andrew Cecil Bennett started off as a PC, but when he couldn't win the leadership, he became head of the Social Credit League. The PCs and Liberals wanted to keep the CCP out of power, so they created an alternative vote system. What they didn't realize was that the second choice for their own voters was the CCP, and the second choice for the CCP was the Social Credit League. It was unexpected when W.A.C. Bennett became premier of the province. The social credit movement was basically a party that believed if you gave everyone minimum income or prosperity grants, people would spend it and stimulate the economy. W.A.C. Bennett would win seven consecutive election victories. However, during this time, he would abandon the social credit philosophy and move the party over to the right. W.A.C. Bennett essentially was now running the B.C. government party. In 1960, he created BC Ferries. In 1961, he created BC Hydro. W.A.C. Bennett also copied Tommy Douglas and created BC Medicare. Bennett also loved having an educated population, so he created the University of British Columbia, the University of Victoria, and the Simon Fraser University. Bennett was also responsible for negotiations for the Columbia River Treaty and used funds from this agreement to pay from more power generation in the province. W.A.C. Bennett was defeated in 1972. A year later, he would resign from politics, at which point his son would take over his seat in Parliament and represent the Bennett name for another two decades. Number four, John Bracken. 
1922, the United Farmers of Manitoba won a surprise victory. The party had not even nominated a leader because their expectations were so low. The party asked John Bracken to act as leader of the party and be premier. On paper, the UFM would become the Coalition Progressive Party of Manitoba. With farmers running the show, the province became deeply interested in farmers' rights, farmers' legislation, and an agrarian society. When government employees went on strike, Bracken fired all of them and replaced them all the next day. Bracken slashed budgets and increased taxes. His populism was deeply rooted in being independent from the bankers and investors. His province would stay in the 19th century throughout his tenure. In 1931, Bracken successfully convinced the entire Manitoba Liberal Party to merge into his Progressive Party. This move gave him the largest majority government in Manitoba history. In 1940, he formed a wartime coalition with the CCF to hold power through World War II. Bracken would resign in 1943 after federal conservatives asked him to be leader. Under his leadership in the 1945 election, Bracken's conservatives had won 27 more seats, the highest amount won by any conservative facing Mackenzie King. He was ousted from the party several years later. Number 3. Joey Smallwood A bit of an oddball in the mix, the Premier of Newfoundland was popular among his people, but mostly because his opposers left the province. On the one hand, he was a champion of the welfare state. But on the other hand, he was the champion of modernization. After running a campaign to get Newfoundland to join Confederation with Canada, Joey ran, ran for Premier and won. Smallwood ran on challenge for 23 years and led to the province's giant diaspora. Today, there are Newfoundlanders across the country and around the world all looking to escape what some refer to as Joey's ghetto. During his quarter century in power, Smallwood was filled with a welfare state and austerity. Smallwood stayed popular as long as he could keep the province's remaining people tied to government welfare. In fact, poverty conditions in Newfoundland reduced heavily under Smallwood and quality of life improved. The austerity bit of it was his Newfoundland modernization plan. Smallwood would pay people to move to larger centers and forbid people from developing on the old land. This is still an issue today as many people live in cabin municipalities that have no access to any emergency services or clean water. Smallwood would still see the destruction of hundreds of communities, which would bring down costs heavily. Smallwood's downfall would be his passion, developing Churchill Falls for electricity. Smallwood went to England in 1952 to look for investors and formed the company Brinko. Quebec refused to allow for power to flow through their borders, and so Newfoundland negotiated a deal in which all power would be sold to Quebec Hydro at a set rate with no inflationary cause. Newfoundland was investing in a power project that would never be used by Newfoundlanders. The contract runs out in 2041. Quebec earns $1.7 billion a year from the project. Newfoundland earns $60 million a year. To date, the project has never turned a profit. Number 2. Ernest Manning. When the Social Credit Party won the election in Alberta, it shocked everyone. Manning took over the party from Eberhardt and led through seven successful election campaigns. Manning saw the party as being greater than Alberta, though, and wanted to expand the brand across the country. Manning would set up provincial parties in BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. Manning would also be on the board for the creation of a federal Social Credit Party. Manning's greatest challenge was to remove the anti-Semitic influences from the party. In 1943, no one cared about anti-Semitism in their parties, but in 1944, when the results of the Holocaust came, became known, everyone sought to purge the anti-Semites, and the Social Credit Party had its lion's share of them. Manning's dominance in politics is unmatched today. No one felt it was worthwhile resisting Manning, and very few people ran for election. Most of his MLAs during these years would simply get elected in a one-party vote. At most, 10 MLAs would run against Manning's party, and very few of them would ever get in. Manning's party was simply the government, and they ran in a non-partisan manner. In future, parties would eventually move right of center to match the social credit success. Manning would retire in 1968 and his party would be kicked out of office three years later by Peter Lougheed. 
who served 14 years by himself, Manning started a consulting firm with his son Preston, who became leader of the Reform Party movement a few years later on. It occurs to me upon getting to number one that there is no Ontario or PEI premiers in Canadian history that has served more than 10 years. But upon looking at this list, you will find that there is one premier represented from every other province. And now to our final premier. Number one, Nova Scotia premier, George Henry Murray. He first became premier at the age of 35, and when he retired at the age of 63, he was almost in the age of retirement. Basically serving his whole life in politics, his early career was not so hot. He tried five times to get elected, and each time was returned a failure. Murray, however, was highly regarded in the party, and in 1869, Premier William Stephen Fieldings would retire from provincial politics and hand leadership over to Murray. Murray was given Fielding's very safe seat, and only narrowly won in a by-election. Murray became a fan of brokerage politics, the idea that all policies should come from multiple parties. Murray was successful in convincing popular candidates from other parties to join his Liberal Party. Cannibalizing the opposition time and time again kept him in power. Murray wasn't a slouch, though. He doubled the railway in Nova Scotia in under 10 years. He formed the Nova Scotia Agricultural College and the Nova Scotia's Technic College in Halifax. On the right of policy, he instituted prohibition and kept Nova Scotia clean of alcohol. On the left, he instituted workers' compensation and women's vote. Murray established nursing clinics and hospitals in order to keep his people healthy. Upon retiring, he turned down a position in Wilfrid Laurier's cabinet and turned down the knighthood twice. Murray would die a few years later.